To catch a glimpse of the universe's faintest lights, astronomers embark on a cosmic quest to the darkest corners of Earth. These stargazers, in pursuit of whispers from space, flee the clatter of radio interference caused by us, noisy humans. Yet, even Earth's remotest locales or its orbital outskirts can eavesdrop on the celestial hum predating the birth of stars. Enter a mind-blowing concept. What if we set up a colossal radio telescope in the ultimate silent retreat? The far side of the moon. Picture this. A mega-telescope perched on the lunar surface, basking in the moon's atmosphere-free tranquility. The lunar promise of a crystal clear sky and a solid foundation could birth a behemoth telescope, dwarfing any Earth-bound or orbital counterparts. While this lunar dream has lingered in scientific whispers, only a modest 2-inch diameter UV scope on China's Chang-3 lander came close. But hold on to your telescopes, folks. This might not just be skyfy fantasy. Meet the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope, a cosmic marvel set to grace a moon crater. If this lunar giant materializes, it'll soar to celestial stardom as one of the universe's largest telescopes, breaking free from Earth's confines. It promises a front-row seat to the cosmic drama, gazing back to the era preceding the birth of stars and galaxies. Believe it or not, this lunar spectacle received a cool half million dollars from NASA's innovative Advanced Concepts program in 2020 to kickstart its feasibility exploration. Convincing NASA to give it the green light. Well, that's another lunar leap. But first, let's join the cosmic enthusiasts and ponder. Could this be the interstellar escapade we've all been waiting for? Welcome to Spaceverse, your cosmic escape on YouTube. Dive into the wonders of space science, astronomy, and the groundbreaking Lunar Crater Radio Telescope proposal. Join us in unraveling the mysteries of the universe and the potential transformation of the moon's far side into a colossal radio telescope. Subscribe for cosmic exploration beyond imagination. Let's quickly revisit why deploying telescopes in space has its perks. Blame it on Earth's bothersome atmosphere. Despite being a seemingly transparent gas, this atmospheric shield transforms into an impenetrable fog for most light wavelengths. Gamma rays, X-rays, and the majority of ultraviolet rays get halted in the upper atmosphere. Only slender portions of infrared light manage to sneak past the water and CO2 molecules, reaching the surface. This leaves Earth with just two clear windows, visible light, and a snippet of the radio spectrum, where almost 100% of photons make it through. To fully explore the electromagnetic spectrum, we resort to space-based telescopes like JWST for infrared, Chandra for X-rays, and Hubble for ultraviolet, each serving its specific wavelength. Hubble, famed for visible light, earns its stripes for a different reason. It sidesteps the atmospheric blurring that bedevils ground-based observations. Surprisingly, while other wavelengths soared into space, radio astronomy lingered on Earth's surface, content with the atmospheric clarity and lack of distortion. So, why the sudden urge to launch a radio telescope into space? All right, let's break it down. Radio photons, with wavelengths ranging from around 1 cm to 10 meters, smoothly sail through our atmosphere. But once we venture into longer wavelengths, trouble brews as the ionosphere steps in, positioned where the atmosphere gracefully bows out into the near vacuum of space. The ionosphere is a realm bombarded by intense solar radiation stripping electrons from atoms and enveloping Earth in a shroud of charged particles. When a radio photon encounters this ionospheric dance floor, it plays a little jig with an electron, resulting in the photon boomeranging back to its origin. Our planet becomes a dual-purpose radio mirror, a nifty tool for bouncing signals over vast terrestrial distances, but a cosmic blackout curtain for long-wavelength radio light, casting space into darkness from our surface perspective. Even low-Earth orbit satellites feel the ionospheric interference, not to mention the chattering of radio-happy local primates, keeping us in the dark about a significant chunk of the electromagnetic spectrum. Enter the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope, poised to revolutionize our cosmic view. While I'm all for exploring novel perspectives just to see what marvels unfold, NASA, being NASA, craves more. To win their cosmic approval, we present a compelling case. The vast and explored territory in the electromagnetic spectrum corresponds to an entire cosmic era we've never laid eyes on. Picture this. The oldest light we can detect is the cosmic microwave background radiation. 
born when the universe was a mere 370,000 years old. The hot hydrogen and helium plasma that once filled the cosmic cradle cooled, allowing the formation of the first atoms and rendering the universe transparent to light. The photons released at this pivotal moment leaned towards the infrared side, embarking on a 13.5 billion year odyssey through an expanding cosmos, undergoing a dramatic redshift from infrared to the millimeter wavelength photons of the cosmic microwave background. It's a celestial journey through time and space, and the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope is our ticket to witness the grand spectacle. Picture this cosmic mystery. After the grand release of the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB, we hit a snag in our celestial fossil record. Somewhere in the vast cosmic expanse, the once dominant hydrogen and helium gases collapsed, birthing the first luminous stars and galaxies that illuminated the cosmos. The James Webb Space Telescope is now catching glimpses of this ancient starlight, but sandwiched between the CMB release and the explosive star formation is a perplexing gap, a cosmic hiatus spanning at least 100 million years. We affectionately term this enigmatic era the Cosmic Dark Ages, a pivotal period crucial for unraveling the cosmic tale that ensued. During these dark ages, the gravitational pull choreographed matter into colossal halos, laying the groundwork for the birth of superclusters of galaxies. Currently, our knowledge relies heavily on simulations, but here's where the Grand Lunar Telescope steps into the scene, promising a first-hand peek into this uncharted epoch. Now, you might wonder, what's there to see? In a universe devoid of stars and galaxies, what kind of light would even grace our telescope? Enter the silent dance of hydrogen and helium gas, remnants destined to birth stars. Although gradually losing their initial heat, they don't fade into complete darkness. A glimmer persists. When the electron within atomic hydrogen switches its spin direction, it releases a feeble 21 cm wavelength radio photon, a whisper in the cosmic silence. Tune your radio antenna toward the Milky Way's interstellar expanse, and voila, a 21 cm signal reveals the cold gas map, a feat accomplished by our trusty Earth-based radio telescopes. Now, here's where it gets cosmic. An E21 cm radiation emitted during the cosmic dark ages undergoes a cosmic makeover. Redshifted by the universe's expansion, a 21 cm photon born when the universe was, let's say, a spry 17 million years old, stretches itself to a majestic 21 meters by the time it reaches us. More distant ancient gas echoes even longer wavelengths, while ordinary 21 cm radio light reaches Earth's surface. The dark age signals, red shifted to the extreme, bounce off our ionosphere, creating a celestial symphony that begs for a space radio telescope to decode the cosmic overture. The plot thickens and the cosmic drama unfolds. All right, buckle up for the Grand Telescope Zarga. Why go colossal and why choose the moon as the cosmic stage? Well, size matters. No, not in a superficial way, but in the realm of telescopes, it's the key to sensitivity. The bigger, the better. Think of it this way. To detect light of a specific wavelength, your telescope needs to match that wavelength or even surpass it in size. And to craft a pristine image, the telescope should dwarf that wavelength by a fair margin. Here's the cosmic math. The telescope's resolution hinges on the ratio of its aperture size to the wavelength it's probing. To get crisp visuals of those majestic tens of meter long radio photons, you're looking at a telescope that's not just big but colossal, hundreds of meters in diameter, to be precise. Yes, we're talking about a behemoth. Now let's delve into the cosmic choreography. It was no small feat to propel JWST 6 and a half meter mirror into the cosmic theater. But hold your glass mirrors. Radio telescopes are a different breed. Forget the hefty, delicate glass mirrors of infrared, visible and ultraviolet telescopes. Our radio telescope mirrors sport a nifty mesh of conducting material. Picture this. The ionosphere reflects radio waves because it's got those elusive electrons dancing around. Now, imagine metal wires with movable electrons. Radio waves hit the wire mesh and bounce they do, as long as the wire grid size plays nice with a wavelength of interest. Shape matters too, and we're talking paraboloid, a circular parabola. This shape coaxes incoming waves from a specific direction to converge at a single cosmic point. Hold your telescope horses, though. Most radio telescopes swivel to catch the celestial action. But at a certain colossal size, swiveling turns into a cosmic ballet challenge. 
the dish warps and wobbles, making fix setups the cosmic preference. Enter China's 500 meters diameter fast telescope nestled in a valley, or Puerto Rico's slightly smaller Arecibo. May it rest in peace. But fear not, for our lunar telescope is about to steal the cosmic spotlight. The moon awaits, the stage is set, and the colossal lunar crater radio telescope is ready to rewrite the cosmic tale with its massive parabolic dance. Oh, and here's a cosmic side note that's just too cool to skip over. Let's peek behind the scenes of these fixed dish marvels. Picture this. They've got a detector, the feed antenna, doing a cosmic chart chart to catch light from various directions. Arecibo, for instance, flaunted an elongated feed antenna to match its spherical dish shape. Meanwhile, Fast pulled off a movable panel routine, warping its dish into a paraboloid that points where the feed antenna calls home. Now, the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope is set to join this celestial dance floor with its 350-meter diameter fixed dish, a cosmic spectacle larger than Arachibo and a tad smaller than Fast. Hold your telescopic horses. This idea isn't exactly fresh out of the cosmic oven. Moon-based fixed-dish radio telescopes have flirted with our imaginations since the 60s. But here's the cosmic hiccup. They couldn't quite replicate an Arachibo-style setup on the Moon. You see, both Arachibo and FAST leaned on hefty support structures to maintain their celestial posture. This need doomed past lunar proposals. Transporting such hefty frameworks to the Moon proved a logistical headache. Enter the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope, which is armed with a brilliant workaround. Suspend the telescope like a colossal space hammock. Ordinarily, a thread between two points forms a catenary, not a parabola. However, sprinkle in a dash of thickness wizardry, thicker edges, a gradual thinning toward the center, and voila, the thread swings as a perfect parabola. Imagine creating a colossal parabolic dish with no supports except the ethereal tethers at its edge. This design not only pulls off a stunning parabolic act, but also braves the lunar temperature roller coaster swaying gracefully between extremes during the lunar day and night. So, behold the Lunar Hammock Telescope, a cosmic marvel, swaying to the rhythm of the universe. The fresh LCRD blueprint envisions a reflector mesh weighing roughly half a ton, with a launch mass approximately three times that, well within the current launch technology's grasp. Yet, it's a cosmic leap from delivering a colossal net to the moon to unfurling it into action. Let me guide you through the game plan as illustrated by the LCRD team's captivating animation. The spacecraft housing the neatly folded telescope gracefully touches down at the heart of the selected crater or more on that selection process later. Harpoons are strategically launched beyond the crater rim, swiftly tightened, and the feed antenna ascends to the soon-to-be focal point of the dish. The mesh unfolds as it's drawn toward the rim, and by tweaking the tethers, the reflector's shape transforms into a pleasing, round paraboloid. Now that we've unraveled the installation dance of a lunar crater radio telescope, the next cosmic step is crater selection. The ideal crater should rest on the far side, preferably nestled deep into the far side, to escape interference from the moon's frustratingly radio-loud planetary companion. Since the telescope lacks the luxury of being stirrable, its fixed gaze aligns with the moon's orientation, creating a sweeping ring as it rotates once monthly. Optimal placement on the lunar equator maximizes this ring's size. However, this location intersects with the bustling radio signals of the Milky Way, which we'd rather filter out. So, positioning it around 15 degrees north of the equator unveils a sizable circle above the galactic disk, offering a clearer glimpse into the universe's dawn. Factor in the prerequisite of a pristine, circular, boulder-free, and reasonably deep crater, and our options dwindle. The leading contender is a modest 1.3 km wide, nearly 300 meters deep crater that, as of now, lacks a name. Despite its anonymity, this crater is spacious enough to comfortably host our Envision Lunar Telescope. While the Moon's entire mass serves as an effective shield against human radio interference, it introduces a challenge in communicating with the observatory. Given the substantial data haul of radio telescopes, transmitting it back to Earth requires a thoughtful strategy. A dedicated relay satellite, possibly orbiting the moon for data uploads on the far side and transmissions on the near side, or a relay stationed at the Earth-Moon L2 Lagrange point, might be the solution. While the proposal for the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope, or LCRD, holds promise with compelling scientific potential, the decision on full NASA funding remains uncertain. 
The proposal is indeed plausible, offering an intriguing avenue to explore the cosmic dark ages. However, alternatives exist, such as covering larger regions of the Moon's far side with simple dipole antennae, or constructing a dipole array using a satellite swarm in lunar orbit or stationed at the L2 point. Each approach has its own set of advantages and drawbacks, and a combination of these methods might prove to be the optimal solution. The idea of transforming the far side of the Moon into a colossal radio telescope, complete with crater dishes and dipolar rays, exudes a captivating allure. Yet, the ultimate verdict lies in NASA's hands. The decision-making process will likely weigh the advantages and disadvantages of various strategies to effectively peer into the cosmic dawn before stars emerged. While the concept sounds exceptionally cool, only time will reveal whether NASA deems it the smartest approach for unraveling the mysteries of the early universe. And that's it. Thank you for joining us on this celestial journey at Spaceverse. If you enjoyed exploring the cosmos and the fascinating prospects of the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Keep gazing at the stars, and until our next cosmic rendezvous, stay curious and reach for the stars.